So welcome to unit eight, motivation, emotion, and stress. Um, if you're just joining this channel, these um, recordings in the AP psychology playlist go along with Meyer psychology for the AP course third edition. Today, we're gonna be going over theories and physiology of emotion. So quite a few learning targets, but we'll try to get through them rather quickly. The first is to describe how arousal, expressive behavior, and cognition interact in emotion. The second is to explain whether we can experience emotions without consciously interpreting and labeling them. Also describe the basic emotions. You may have learned some of them from the movie Inside Out. It's actually quite accurate. But, um, and the link between emotional arousal and the autonomic nervous system. Um, the next one is to discuss whether different emotions activate different physiological and brain pattern responses. And finally, discuss the effectiveness of polygraphs in using body states to detect lies. So what is emotion? Um, we probably have a general feeling <laughs> about what the word emotion means. Feelings, right? But in terms of the definition in psychology, we think of it as a response of the whole organism involving physiological arousal, expressive behavior, and conscious experience. So you see in this image to the right, um, these women are experiencing probably some really strong emotion at that point, right? That's serious joy. How do the three pieces fit together? So emotion research considers two big question, questions. Does your body, bodily arousal come before or after your emotional feelings? So as we're going through these different theories about emotion, uh, I want you to think about what you think. Um, does, do you feel, does your emotion come first or does your bodily arousal come first? How, and then how does thinking, which we think of as cognition in psychology, right, and feeling interact? Does cognition always come before emotion? Historical emotion theories, as well as current research, have sought to answer these two really big questions. So we're going to start off with one of the first um, formal theories of emotion, Jane, the James Lang theory of emotion. Um, and if James sounds familiar, we've talked a little bit about William James in this class, especially in the first um, unit of our textbook. So the James Lang theory of emotion says that, the, that our experience of emotion is our awareness of our physiological responses to an emotion arousing stimulus. Stimulus leads to arousal, which leads to emotion. So we feel sorry because we cry, angry because we strike, afraid because we tremble. So Walter Cannon disagreed with the James Lang theory of emotion. Um, and so he and his graduate student, he was a physiologist at Harvard, and he and his graduate student disagreed, and they said, they asked the question, does a racing heart signal fear or anger or love? Um, the body's responses, heart rate, perspiration, and body temperature are too similar, and they change too slowly to cause the different emotions, according to them. So the cannon barred thalamic theory of emotion is the theory that an emotion arousing stimulus simultaneously, so at the same time, triggers physiological responses and the subjective experience of emotion. So if we think back to our um, biological basis of behavior modules, um, specifically, apparently right here, <laughs> module 11, um, think about the thalamus. At the top of the brain is the brain's sensory control center. The Cannabar theory suggests that stimulus arousal and emotion are a combined response, simultaneous, to a stimulus. After exposure to a stimulus, sensory signals are transmitted to the thalamus. Once the thalamus receives the signal, it relays the information to two structures, the amygdala and the brain cortex. So the amygdala is responsible, if you think back, some of those things we covered earlier in some of the earlier modules, if you listen to them, the amygdala is responsible for the instantaneous emotional response, that fear, rage, those kind of things. And the cerebral cortex directs that response. Simultaneously, the sympathetic nervous system sends signals to the muscles and other parts of the body, causing them to tense or prepare for that fight, flight, or freeze. 
So these theories differ a bit. So James Lang theory, physiological responses occur first and are the cause of emotions. With the Cannon Bard theory, the emotional and the physical response occur simultaneously. One is not dependent on the other. So the James Lang theory and the Cannon Bard theory both take into account physiological responses and in the interplay with emotion. So that's how they have some similarities. But how does cognition, how does our thinking factor into the theory of emotion? So Stanley Schachter and Jerome Singer demonstrated that how we appraise or interpret our experiences also matters. So they have the, they developed the Schachter-Singer two-factor theory of emotion, our physical reactions and our thoughts. So our perceptions, memories, interpretations together create emotion. In their two-factor theory, emotions have two ingredients, both the physical arousal and the cognitive appraisal. An emotional experience to them requires a conscious interpretation of that physiological, physical arousal. So arousal spills over from one event to the next, and this is called the spillover effect. For instance, in this image, it shows a good um, uh, descrip description of this. Arousal from a soccer match can fuel anger, which can descend into rioting or other violent confrontations. So Schachter and Singer did some research, really fascinating research in this area. They injected college men with the hormone epinephrine, which, caught, which triggers feelings of arousal. One group of men were told the injection would help test their eyesight. The second group were told they might experience arousal because of the drug. After receiving the injection, subjects went to a waiting room with another person, actually a confederate and accomplice of the experimenters who was acting either euphoric or irritated. So the results of the study were fascinating. Subjects began to feel their heart race, body flush, and breathing become more rapid. The subjects who attributed their arousal to the drug felt little emotion. The subjects who had been told the injection would produce no arousal caught the apparent emotion of the other person in the waiting room. They became happy if the accomplice was acting euphoric and sort of testy if the accomplice was acting irritated. So that discovery stirred up that a stirred up state can be experienced as one emotion or another, depending on how we interpret it and label it, has been replicated in dozens of experiments. And it's still um, very influential in modern emotion research. So if you're taking the AP exam, and you've, or even if not, here's a tip. Um, be prepared for at least a multiple choice question that tests your ability to compare these theories. There, you know, this is a little bit confusing, so make sure you understand the differences and to some extent the similarities between these theories of emotion. Does cognition have to precede emotion? Must we always interpret our arousal before we can experience an emotion? Um, psychologist Robert Zajonk <laughs> didn't think so. He contended that we actually have many emotional reactions apart from or even before our conscious interpretation of a situation. So in our two-track brain, sensory input may be rooted to the cortex via the thalamus for analysis and transmission to the amygdala. You can see all those structures right there. Or directly to the amygdala via the thalamus for an sort of instant snap emotional reaction. So we've got this high road versus low road. Um, some complex emotions like hatred and love travel a high road. A stimulus following this path would travel via the thalamus to the brain's cortex. There it would be analyzed and labeled before the response command, send, command is sent out via the amygdala. On the other hand, the low road. Um, some simple emotions such as likes, dislikes, and fears take what um, Joseph Ledoux called the more direct low road, a neural shortcut that bypasses the cortex. Following the low road, a fear provoking stimulus would travel from the eye or ear via the thalamus directly to the amygdala. So how do these two theories of emotion compare, the ones we just went over? So the Schachter Singer one, um, in that one, our appraisal and labeling of events also determ determines our emotional responses. Um, but in the Zhang Ledoux ideas, some emotional responses are immediate before any conscious appra appraisal. 
So emotion researcher Richard Lazarus conceded that our brain processes vast amounts of information without our conscious awareness, and that some emotional responses do not seem to require conscious think thinking. But he wondered, how would we know if what we are reacting to, if I totally messed that up, how would we know what we are reacting to if we did not in some way appraise the situation? So Lazarus concluded that the appraisal may be effortless and we may not be conscious of it, but it is still a mental function. To know whether a stimulus is good or bad, the brain must have some idea of what it is. He proposed that emotions arise when we appraise an event as harmless or dangerous. So like, for example, we appraise the sound of rustling bushes as the presence of threat. Later on, we realized that it may have just been wind and it wasn't a threat. So what are the basic emotions? This is where that, um, if you've watched Inside Out, the wonderful movie, children's animated movie, it was not really a children's movie, I love it, um, uh, can, can help you out in understanding some of the basic emotions. So when surveyed, most emotion scientists agreed that fear, disgust, sadness, and happiness are basic emotions. Carol Izzard, um, isolated 10 basic emotions, joy, interest, excitement, surprise, sadness, anger, disgust, contempt, fear, shame, and guilt. Most present in infancy. Others believe that pride and love are also basic emotions. So how are our emotions and our autonomic nervous system related? So if you think back again to some of those earlier modules, the biological basis of behavior, remember from module 10, that the autonomic nervous system controls the arousing and calming of the physiology of the body in times of crisis or stress by activating the sympathetic division and the parasympathetic division, right? So you can look at this chart while I take a sip of water um, to see how these um, emotions are related to the ANS. So how does the sympathetic division of the ANS activate the body in a crisis? So that um, it directs your adrenal glands to release epinephrine, your adrenaline, and norepinephrine, epinephrine, your um, noradrenaline. The liver pours extra sugar into the bloodstream, respiration, heart rate, and blood pressure increase, digestion slows, pupils dilate, perspiration increases, and blood clots more quickly. So lots of physical changes happen when your body sort of is activated into a crisis. Um, the parasympathetic nerve, the parasympathetic division gradually calms your body. A stress hormones slowly leave your bloodstream. If you think about any time when you had a situation like this man trying to save um, this boy, likely his son, um, you can think about that stress feeling versus a calming relief. Um, when your respiration, your heart rate, and your blood pressure decrease, your pupils constrict, and your salivation and digestion activate. So can one brain region be responsible for different emotions? Yes. So consider the insula, a neural center deep inside the brain. It's activated when we experience various negative social emotions, such as disgust, lust, and pride. In brain scans, it becomes active when people bite into something disgusting, smell disgusting food, Think about biting a disgusting cockroach, which I don't want to be doing now, or feel moral disgust over sort of a sleazy business exploiting someone. Do different emotions trigger different brain circuits? So observers watching, here's some, some of the research says, observers watching fearful faces showed more amygdala activity than did other observers who watched angry faces. Depression prone people and those with generally negative perspectives have shown more right frontal lobe activity. People with positive personalities have shown more activity in the left frontal lobe than in the right. How, if, so let's switch gears a little bit. How effective are polygraphs in using body states to detect lies? So polygraphs purport to measure emotion links. They, they are trying to figure out if you're telling the truth, right? And they measure emotion linked autonomic arousal as reflected in changing breathing, heart rate, and perspiration. Can these results be used to detect lies. 
And this is an example of questions that would be asked in a polygraph and an example of kind of what it looks like. So are polygraphs reliable? And these polygraph, if these polygraph experts had been the judges, more than one third of the innocent would have been declared guilty and nearly one fourth of the guilty would have gone free. So that's, they're really, really questionable. The CIA and other US agencies have spent millions of dollars testing tens of thousands of employees, employees, yet the US National Academy of Sciences has reported that no spy has ever been caught by using the polygraph. So we are to our learning target reviews. Okay, let's review what we've gone over in this rather long module. Emotions are psychological responses of the whole organism involving an interplay. So sort of this, you know, it's like a whole bunch of things going on within your body, right? Um, among physical arousal, expressive behaviors, and conscious experience. Theories of emotion generally address two major questions. Does physiological arousal come before or after emotional feelings? And how do cognition and feeling interact? So understanding that is important, that, that these theories that we've talked about, we talked about in this module, they're generally getting at these two big questions um, about emotion. The James Lang theory maintains that emotional feelings follow our body's responses to emotion inducing stimuli. So we observe our heart pounding and feel fear. The Canon Bard Thalmic theory proposes that our body responds to emotion at the same time that we experience the emotion. One does not cause the other, it's simultaneous. The Schachter Singer two factor theory holds that our emotions have two ingredients physical arousal and a cognitive label. The cognitive labels we put on our states of arousal are an essential ingredient of emotion. Lazarus agreed that many important emotions arise from our inferences about them. Zajonk and Ledoux, however, contended that some simple emotional responses occur instantly, not only outside of our conscious awareness, but before any cognitive processing occurs. This interplay between emotion and cognition illustrates our two-track mind. So Carol Izzard's 10 basic emotions are joy, interest, excitement, surprise, sadness, anger, disgust, contempt, fear, shame, and guilt. Um, the arousal component of emotion is regulated by the autonomic, autonomic nervous system sympathetic and parasympathetic, that arousing versus calming division. In a crisis, the fight or flight response automatically mobilizes your body for action. The large scale body changes that accompany fear and anger and sexual arousal are very similar. They include increased perspiration, breathing and heart rate, though they feel very different. Emotions may be similarly arousing, but some subtle physiological responses such as facial muscle movements distinguish them for, for most people. More meaningful differences have been found in activity in some brain pathways and cortical areas within the brain. So polygraphs, which measure several physiological indicators of emotions are not accurate enough to justify widespread use in business and law enforcement. The use of guilty knowledge questions and new forms of technology may produce better indications of lying. Whew, that was a pretty long one. Thank you so much for listening and take care.